Hey everybody, this is Charlie from Be With. I hope you're doing well today. Today's conversation is with Jackson Peterson. Jackson is an American spiritual teacher and the author of The Natural Bliss of Being, in which he presents his unique perspective on enlightenment teaching. And Jackson's had a fascinating journey. For over 45 years, he studied directly with spiritual masters around the world from Japan, China, India, Nepal, the Middle East, and in many different spiritual traditions, such as Zen Buddhism, Dzogchen Buddhism, Vedanta, Sufism, Kabbalah, and many more. All a part of his search to see if you could find the common denominators that unite all mystical spiritual traditions. And that's what we speak about in this conversation. It's a talk that really gets to the heart of what a lot of spiritual practice is about. So I, I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please subscribe to our channel. And without further ado, here's Jackson Peterson. You have studied in so many traditions and, and how you describe your, um, your goal, so to speak, is to distill it into something that's eclectic and free of dogma and points the way to enlightenment teachings without maybe the, the baggage of the cultural uh, accoutrements. So, so yeah, what, now that we're recording, what, Let's start there, just like um, people who are seeking liberation from suffering, interested in this idea of enlightenment or awakening. Uh, how do you begin helping people in that direction? Well, I think first I try to get an understanding of what their understanding is and what they think they're looking for. What do they mean by enlightenment? What do they mean by liberation? What do they mean by these concepts? And then based on that, I kind of go with my understanding. But basically what people are looking for, once they've kind of got the feel, maybe they've read some books on Zen or whatever it may be, or Advaita Vedanta, they get this idea of liberation, moksha, um, enlightenment. In general, what I try to do is find a generic way First of all, to find out the common denominators, are there really common denominators among all the great mystical systems? And the ones I investigated really deeply in those countries with those masters was uh, Sufism, Kabbalah, um, Dzogchen most deeply, Zen most deeply, um, and uh, Advaita Vedanta not quite so deeply. Kundalini Yoga, I started learning that in India. And um, this sudden school of Zen, which I picked up on in the late 70s in China. I was in China and found a teacher who actually transmitted that and was one of the last of that lineage. He was an 84-year-old man by the name of um, Yan Waishi. And that was really what I was looking for, is, is there some kind of way that it can be communicated such that somebody could kind of get it suddenly and immediately, this idea of sudden enlightenment, which was somehow in my bones from about the age of 16, when I first started reading um, Zen writings and teachings from uh, this writer by the name of Suzuki, not Suzuki Roshi, but D.T. Suzuki. And so I kind of got this... Um, obsession to find out is there this thing called sudden enlightenment where it's not a gradual thing over a long period of you know decades of meditating in caves and doing all of that is there really something like that and so when i went to china in the 1970s late 1970s and met this teacher who spoke beautiful british english um and he was a lineage master of that one of the last and I had a conversation with him, which I talk about in my book in, in exact detail. Um, he was of that lineage. And that sudden school of enlightenment lineage goes back to what's known as the sixth patriarch of Zen in China, Hui Neng, who was living around the 600s. And so this goes all the way back to Bodhidharma and the roots in India and going back to the Buddha. So Can you clarify this, what is meant by sudden enlightenment? Just, well, just sudden that. enlightenment means, sure, the sudden enlightenment means where you have this like sudden insight. So, you know, imagine like you're just a normal person and you suddenly take a powerful dose of 
pure LSD and you're just suddenly in a different state and you, you may have the good fortune of saying, oh my God, I just see it all so clearly. And it's a complete shift in consciousness to where there's something really that you've never seen before, but now seeing it gives you great insight into the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. So this sudden enlightenment is not something gradual that sneaks up on you. It's like when it's transmitted to you, there's this sudden um, insight into the nature of it, which um, allows one to um, see this immediately. And then um, there's a, a radical alteration in the way you perceive reality. And then that kind of blossoms over time. But that's the idea of the sudden enlightenment, that it's, it's not a, a progressive, gradual kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a sudden pointing out, and then there's the, this shift that occurs, like a quantum leap from one state to another without intervening between the two. Mm. Mm. And, and you're saying it was in your bones. It's, it was something deep within you that was searching or, or, or curious about this possibility. Yes, yeah, because those were the conversations I read in all of these Zen books I started purchasing when I was 15 and 16. And um, that's what was intriguing is some of these conversations the Zen masters would have with their disciples and students. And there would be like the, the, the it would say at the end of it that the, that the disciple suddenly was fully enlightened at this pointing out. And it, you know, it could be something really obscure and something that I didn't get at all. Why would that cause that? And I said, this is something that's really, really intriguing. And it seems to be very sudden and radical. And those were words that were very much intimate to myself. <laughs> well, there's a sense that, um, that one has to be sort of seeking to alleviate suffering or, 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 in, a, or in an experience of suffering to pursue these, these spiritual paths, but that's not necessarily the case. You, you're, not, you're not talking about you had some deep suffering that you were trying to relieve. You, you were just called by the possibility, it sounds like. Well, I think we're all driven by our own personal suffering, you know, like to become liberated into this joyous state of bliss is a counterpoint to all of our anxieties, whatever they may be and whatever their causes and roots are. It's, it sounds good. And so um, that too is something like, you know, it's kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm in, I'm in on this one. Let's, let's see where this ride goes. So that's kind of like was the, the initial impetus. Right. So, so you were saying you, you met this 84-year-old Zen master. And, and what was your experience with him? Well, without going through the, without going through the whole you know, discussion in the book and so forth, but it basically came down to I was trying to mentally conceive, conceptualize, intellectually, um, structure a kind of different way of looking at life that kind of explained everything, kind of like my complete theory of everything. And I was just thinking that I needed some, you know, little missing blocks in my Lego structure that would, you know, be the final crowning touch to this elegant construction that I had made. And so I was looking more for confirmation as well as maybe something new that would really, you know, be a breakthrough. I, I'd kind of built this intellectual understanding of it and um, pointing that out to him. And he just, just sort of looked at me kind of like everything I just said to him in my descriptions of, of my insights into the nature of reality. It's as though it had no significance to him at all. And it's, you know, this is kind of like my pride and joy, my conceptual structure of the true nature of reality. And and um, he made some comments about how um, it's, you know, it's, it's not like that. It's not a construction. It's not something that you construct and as an intellectual project. It's a deeper level of being, a ground of being that becomes exposed suddenly that you didn't even really realize was even there. Uh, but it's been there all along and it gets exposed suddenly and you can't get to it through building a stairway of more and more intelligent thought constructs. And so he said to me, you know, 
along those lines of, you know, like it's not something you construct like that. And I said to him, said, aha. So it's the other way. It's like you have to simplify. You have to simplify it to a complete simplicity. The opposite way of building up a, 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 an intellectual construction, sophisticated and elegant that explains it all. You have to simplify. And he looked at me and he shook his head and he said, no, no, no. He said, you have made it hopelessly complex. And I thought, to simplify is to make it hopelessly complex. Bing! <laughs> then it was just this flash of insight that there's nothing you can do to bring this about and any doing to do it about, even to trying to simplify, like you're making a simpler construction. Before it was an elegant theory of everything. Now you're going to encapsulate it in this simplicity, kind of like the ultimate equation, you know, very simple E equals MC squared explains it all. So you've taken all of this huge edifice of stuff and you've reduced it down to this formula. And he said, no, it's not even a formula. It's nothing there at all. And the insight was that it's not to do with thought at all. It's not to do with concept. It's not to do with the intellect. It's not, has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's, it's on a completely different um, category of phenomena. And in that moment, there was just this empty stillness in my mind. And in that gap between complexity and simplicity and no thought at all gave this opportunity for this um, kind of this emergent eruption of my true nature to present itself nakedly, so to speak, into which it was just, ah, <laughs> oh, I see. I've been going in the wrong direction. Whichever direction I've been going was the wrong one in every case. And, uh, you know, he nodded and we had a, a great laugh. I couldn't stop laughing for five minutes in that insight. And it was shortly thereafter, literally hours, that he transmitted the lineage to me and um, asked me to teach others. So anyway, that's how I really got the gist of this whole thing for the first time. And I take it your, your remarkable construct, your edifice of the nature of reality, paled in comparison to the experience of realization in that moment. It didn't hold up, I suppose. Well, what it was like is, like I had studied swimming, not having swum myself, but I went and interviewed all of the great Olympic champions and all the way back and met with them and talked with them and watched them and made videos of their swimming. And they explained to me the different swimming strokes and how you hold your breath when you're doing this and how to launch yourself off into the, the, to the pool and all of this in great, great detail to where I could explain and teach anyone even how to swim just based on what I was told and how you move your arms and how you do all that. And I was, would have been very pleased with my knowledge about swimming, and I could be considered a swimming coach and expert in that. But having actually been pushed into the water, suddenly having never been swimming before, and then suddenly I'm, I'm swimming, and all of that theory that I studied just was gone. I wasn't thinking, okay, right hand first, then the left, and then the feet, and then this. None of that was there. It was just swimming. And there I was swimming. That it was like that, that, that difference between the, the theoretical and the, and the actual, which had nothing to do with the other. Mm. Mm -hmm. So in your experience as a teacher and also in your own path, I'm really interested in, in sort of what groundwork is or was necessary to allow for that unfolding to occur. In other words, do you think it was years or, or however long practice that enabled that moment to blossom the way it did? Or is it possible that, that people with no prior study, practice, or inquiry could, could have that kind of realization? I think uh, the latter is best, to have absolutely no um, work or practice um, or study in this area. However, there has to be enough of a familiarity with the topics that we're talking about whether it's through conversation or having, you know, watched a few videos or something and you kind of have the general gist and you kind of get it. You're kind of, 
intelligent enough to to get the general idea of what's going on here and um, then allowing me to work with that person for instance I was giving a retreat last year in Scotland and I was giving the direct introduction the actual doing it which we'll do in this in this conversation to the group and um, a guy arrived late who I'd never seen before. I didn't know who he was. He arrived late and he stuck his head in the door. He was about 30 years old or so. And um, just as I was giving the, this instruction, uh, I'll just give you the tail end of this. We can talk about this more later, but it it's, makes the point. I said, okay, so I said to the group, so if you notice in this space right behind your eyes, a sense that you're there, there's a presence of your own awareness right there, as though it's looking out the eyes, it's conscious and it's present, and it's actually a beingness, which is your own consciousness. And you notice how it's there, independent of the brain, of the mind, and it's just this pure, sheer, crystal clear presence of awareness. And as I said that, this guy just, a, you know, a minute before I'd stuck his head in the door, not sure whether he should walk in and take a seat or not, but he heard all, he heard just what I just said. And I always, after I make that sort of presentation, I just sort of wait as a pause to see what happens with the group. And he goes, oh my God, I, oh my God. And everybody turns their head and looks and see him still, you know, with his head half in the door. And he goes, oh my God, that's what this is. Oh my God. And I said, see, anyone else? And then three girls put their hands up. Yes, absolutely, absolutely perfect. So it was like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful story. It can happen just like that. It did. It did. And what's interesting is that it sounds as if that individual didn't even have to create the possibility for that happening. It's not like he set up the possibility that he was going to have an enlightenment experience. It just stumbled upon him as he walked in the door. But you see, he was prepared. And the way he was prepared, he, you know, you have to understand the psychological posture. He's coming to an uncertain lecture or seminar or teaching about this topic and he knows he's late he's sticking his head in the door just to see if it's the appropriate time to walk in or should he wait a little bit for maybe i take a break or you know a pause in what i'm saying and so he's kind of there with a sort of sense of open anticipation but he's not following a intellectual track of thought he's really there kind of nakedly aware and present and available mm. to see what's what's what should I do now, and that's kind of like the perfect posture. If somebody's been trained and they've been sitting there all day and they've been listening and they've been trying to get it and they're trying to figure it out in their mind and they're doing this, they're just not in the right posture. They're in a kind of a closed, intellectually thought-filled kind of expecting something kind of thing and all of that. So that, that, that situation doesn't work so well as it does, as it did for this individual. Right. So there's a certain alchemy of, of sort of being slightly off balanced or slightly um, destabilized to some degree, perhaps, or... I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it the way you phrased it. Okay. I would say there's a certain... Un unexpected um, reception of information to where there wasn't an expectation, a specific expectation that didn't really set them off balance. That's another approach. But in this, it's more one of where the, the ripeness we're talking about isn't accumulated over time. This sort of ripeness is being in that moment such that you're kind of like a child for the first time walking into a, an incredibly beautiful decorated Tibetan temple with all of the, the fancy pictures and Buddha statues and everything that's never seen anything like that before a little four-year-old and they walk in and their eyes are just kind of like open and kind of like, wow. 
the closest you can kind of come to something that's kind of like that, not really in awe, but kind of an openness with a willingness to experience that sort of thing. And it's very, it's a spontaneous kind of thing. It's not a premeditated kind of like, I'm ready now. I've got my notepad and that kind of thing. Mm. So I'm really interested in the kind of multidisciplinary approach that you've taken in your life between different traditions, because there is some common wisdom. I don't know how wise it is necessarily that one ought to stick to one path and penetrate one path deeply as opposed to moving between different approaches and picking and choosing. And I'm curious, what have you discovered about trying to integrate all of these teachings into one coherent um, enlightenment uh, teaching? Well, I'm actually doing the opposite. I'm not trying to integrate. I'm not trying to create some kind of synchronistic um, gathering together of great ideas, the best in plucking them from each. I'm actually doing the reverse. What I'm trying to do is extract the common denominators. Mm. And in extracting the common denominators, I'm not putting something together. I'm trying to take away all of the baggage and the stuff that really isn't priority necessary. And what does that leave us with? That leaves us with this pretty lean machine, something that's been stripped of a lot of things that actually aren't assistive, but to, they've been, as part of tradition, they've been... Mm, treated as though they're necessary in, in this. And they might have been hanging around for 600 years, but 700 years, they didn't even have that as, a, as an aspect of that path. That got added in due to some person's insights or book or something that they visionary experience, and then they added and became part of the tradition. What really, the real question for me was, what do you really need in order to get to this, this uh, state where you become free of all personal suffering? That's the goal. The, the, what we say in Buddhism is the bodhicitta is this mind that's free of all suffering. And it, you know, expands and shares that with others naturally and spontaneously. And it can only do it from a mind that is already liberated. And so it then naturally just sort of radiates this, this liberating wisdom and knowledge. So that, that's the question is, how do you um, uh, get there? So what I did first was, in my different experiences, I did exactly that. I, I would like, I'm a, I'm a Zen person, or nope, I'm, now I'm a Sufi person forever. That's it, I'm a Sufi person. And then I would continue like that, and then have some sort of, uh, contact with something else and would send me off a little bit on a different direction. And I go, oh my God, that answers this question. So right. then I would go deeper in this other direction and say, well, this is good, what I was just doing, but wow, this is a, a really good insight. You know, it's like studying physics and going from classical physics to quantum mechanics to quantum field theory to who knows what. There's this progression of insights that kind of like, go, oh, well, this is better. I can jettison the, the rest. The, the earlier stuff, because this is, you know, this is the new one. So I did that for a while too. But what I started to discover is that the real powerful aspects of all of these traditions were the same. Mm. They were the same. There was this coming to see exactly what you are. There was this process of where all thinking and thought and conceptualizing must cease at some point in this, in this kind of process. And then there's other more mystical kinds of things dealing with clairvoyance, past lives, and out-of-body experiences and stuff. But that we can put, you know, in, in a different sort of category of experience, but more directly being focused on personal liberation from one's own suffering and, and having a true understanding of what our true spiritual inner nature actually is. And so in doing that, I discovered, in my opinion, being academic as well as a practitioner and a yogi in all of these teachings and not working from books but working with the real masters and for some reason they like me and I picked it up well and so they would reveal a lot of stuff to me that they don't think they normally well I know they didn't reveal it to a lot of people for many years who didn't quite get it so quickly so I had that advantage of being a quick learner in terms of real practice and having these insights and I was able to see, in my opinion, what worked and what didn't work. And 
I started to say, well, this is a waste of time. A good example of this, and this, you know, some some people may argue with me on this, but I think I can I can defend my position. Usually, the tradition in the Tibetan tradition of the sudden enlightenment teachings called Dzogchen, which is Tibetan, which means the great perfection. Uh, in that particular teaching, um, the the idea is that you are able to uh, enter into this teaching immediately. And that what the teacher is supposed to do from one of the earliest, the earliest founder human teacher of this lineage, his name was in Tibetan Garab Dorje. One of the things that he left as part of his teaching was that the very first thing you do is you give them the direct introduction into their true nature, similar to what I was talking about in Scotland. You do that first, and then you assist them in overcoming any remaining doubts. And then they are allowed just to continue in that insight now that it's free of any any further doubts. That's it. That's the total path of Dzogchen from the beginning. And then over the years, it branched off into different groups and different sorts of uh, traditional lineages of how it was presented. And now today, up until fairly recently, the last 40 years probably, um, you always had to do what was called the preliminary practices. Um, in Tibetan, it was called nondro. So you'd maybe take one or two or three years to go through all of these, these things of bowing, visualizations and prayers, very ritualistic. And um, you had to do all of that uh, before you could get the real stuff. And even then, the real stuff wasn't really the real stuff. It was stuff about the real stuff, but it wasn't the, the real stuff. So um, there weren't many people in my experience that were having success in today's experiences of Dzogchen and, and most of these other traditions. So I wanted to find out why isn't it working? And because I've, I concluded it wasn't working because even the great teachers of these traditions who were alive recently, many of them um, had a lot of problems with their students, sexual abuse, alcohol, drugs, and all kinds of strange things, which meant to me that they didn't really make it, so to speak, clearly. And why would that be if they'd gone through all of this stuff? What was it that was you know, lacking? What was missing in it? So as far as our chin goes, I discovered that this, these preliminary practices not only were not taught in the beginning, but they were added on later. And that uh, people would ask me, do I have to do these preliminary practices first? I say, no, absolutely not. They weren't part of this teaching. These were all add-ons that were part of other traditions that kind of got leaked into these other traditions. And that seemed to be the case for most of the other traditions, whether it be Sufism, Kabbalah, or, or all of these ones together, that they had their own storyline. I have to include Taoist yoga, Taoist alchemy as well, because that's right in there in, in these in these enlightenment practices. So then you, you, the idea would be, well, let's cut off all of the stuff that isn't necessary and be left with just the real core. So it's not, you know, synthesizing some taking from here and from there, but let's find out what's the real core in each of these. And I'm finding out the core was the same. So they're all pointing to the same thing, but they're pointing at it from different ways. And sometimes their way of pointing at it was very um, obscuring. It was actually not what really wasn't beneficial, wasn't helpful in being able to really get to the to the meat of the matter as quickly as possible. And for me, it was always as quickly as possible, but be thorough, thorough, quickly and thorough, completely thorough, leaving no, nothing, nothing left unturned, but as quickly as possible. You know, that's the kind of the American mm -hmm. part of it in here. It's quickly as possible, but you get the full, you get the whole thing, you get the everything in, included. So that then led me in the direction of generating what I have loosely called the way of light. And the way of light is kind of like this generic stripped down thing that doesn't have any kind of necessity of participating in any of these traditions uh, or their associated religious traditions like Sufism's associated with Islam and Christian Orthodox mysticism is, is associated with Christianity. Kabbalah is associated with Judaism and, you know, all of these various things that you don't have to participate in any of that. You can just go, you know, straight for it and being able to do that. And so that's kind of what 
where I come off of, but a lot of times the people who are in my groups, they um, uh, are very much like you were describing. They want to go one path. They want to stay on the one path. So I kind of become their expert because they can't find teachers that to teach this stuff so openly and have learned it so deeply, so completely and academically as well. I can, I can hold my own against all the academics and most of these. And just because I, I like to read that stuff as well as, as practice it and uh, have done that quite thoroughly. So I think that the notion of sticking on one path in one tradition is good if that path works. Mm. If it delivers what it promises, if the marketing propaganda delivers what the, um, the promise is, then that's true. But I haven't found that to be the case. I found almost no one um, having success on any of these paths. Almost no one. They're having relative success, meaning they're maybe more calm. They're less stressed out. Their life is going better. Their relationships are going better. But they're not necessarily breaking through in any real kind of permanent way that kind of obliterates the fundamental ignorance and confusion that's mm -hmm. causing their suffering in almost every one of those paths. And we could take, you know, each path, which we really don't have to do in this discussion. And I can explain to you why and where I think they've gone off track and why it's not producing the kind of results that have been being promised down through the centuries. Um, but if you actually interview the people, like I have in my groups, literally over 50,000 people, if you take all my groups and you look at the totals, the numbers of members in those groups, there's over 50,000. Now there's overlap amongst the groups. So maybe we've got 30,000, 25,000 people in the groups, but these are my guinea pigs. So as I put out my, my um, posts and my texts and get feedback from people, both in private emails and in the threads and being able to do that, I'm getting a feel for who's getting it. And very often I'll put out a, maybe once or twice a year, I'll say, who really gets this and has become free, totally free of suffering in their life and feel that they are fully liberated. And I never get anybody that says, you know, privately even, Jackson, you know, I'm there, or this has occurred here as well. I can, you know, blah, blah, blah. No one. Now I'll get things like, well, pretty much, but then I lose it pretty much. But, you know, then, then I lose it. And then, you know, then I'm scrambling to try to get back to get some sort of stability, some sort of to maintain this longer seems to be the, the big <laughs> common theme. Once, mm -hmm. once I see this, how can I keep from losing it sort of thing? So that seems to be the, uh, the, big, the big question. And it doesn't seem to be working. None of these paths as they are seem to, I haven't met anyone yet and I haven't met a teacher that's impressed me enough. I've met some personally but not in the, in the mainstream of where you go to meet a teacher and, you know, and doing that, that's impressed me with their videos or their discussions or whatever, or even the feedback I get from their students that they themselves are still working on it. Well, you're talking about success as some kind of abiding awakening. Is that what you mean? Where the causes of suffering have been eliminated. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting hearing well, you said so much that I'm really interested in. One of them is about what appears to me as two different metrics of success, because there's the metric of success that's okay, truth and, and the alleviation of, of the, the root causes of suffering, ultimate truth. And that's kind of perhaps a higher, uh, loftier uh, metric of success. But many people probably define success as that social bonding, the feeling a little better, the other thing. And I think people, we all have to get very clear about what we're after when we enter into these paths because there's the different metrics of success and the very rituals that you're talking about not being useful for, for one version of success perhaps is useful for the other version of success. Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm the radical guy. I'm the guy, when you want to go the full Monty, when you want to go the full thing, you come and see me. If you mm -hmm. want the other thing, go to all the different teachers. It's pretty much all the same. And it doesn't matter which tradition you're in. You're going to feel better. You're going to have hope. You're going to, you're going to have some success. And if you're diligent about doing the practices they give you, you're going to have some progress. You're going to have some insights. And you are going to feel more liberated 
and you are going to feel more positive and you are going to um, uh, have a sense that you're getting it more and more and getting a deeper and deeper understanding. But the problem is there's always a you there who is feeling that. And you don't get anywhere until that you is missing and there's no one there seeking to follow the path. So that's kind of like the big shift is that it becomes kind of a, a marketing scheme, kind of a, a capitalistic marketing and propaganda to draw the people along like, yeah, if you do this, you're going to get eternal bliss and you know, you won't have to reincarnate or if you want to reincarnate, you can and you can have the best reincarnations you could have possibly imagined. Or, or when you die, you can go to paradise and have 72,000 virgins, you know, for, for, oh, wow, that sounds good. Sign me up. Whatever that is that they're doing, that sort of thing is kind of like what's being marketed. And the, the whole Buddhist path has been kind of turned into this enlightenment quest for the benefit of me, my enlightenment, my liberation, so that I can then turn around and help and liberate all these other beings, but all from the position of me doing it. I am doing it. It's me. I'm free and all of that. Whereas this, this path we're going to probably get into here is not about any of that at all. None of it. Not, not even slightly. Would you say it's about the dissolution of the, the, the notion of a me? It's about the dissolution of ignorance. Yeah. And that ignorance is things that are like a small child believing in Santa Claus and learning that belief, as cute as it may be, and taught my children the same thing, is that it's ignorance, meaning there isn't a Santa Claus. Or children believing and being afraid, which was mine also, uh, and myself personally, that there's monsters under the bed. My brother had convinced me and I had to sort of go running and take a running leap either on the bed or off the bed when I was little because the monsters, he told me, would grab my feet and pull me under. So becoming free of those monsters also, you realize that. And it's like, uh, you know, looking at a rope in the dark and seeing and, and, and believing this coiled rope is a snake. And then you, you experience this fear until the lights go on a little more. And suddenly the, the rope is seen to be a rope and not a snake. And there never was a snake there. We're seeing lots of these snakes. And one of the snakes we'll, we're, we'll talk about more is this. Our consciousness looks at our body, physical body and comes up with this idea of I am my body. And it looks at the functioning activities of the mind and says, oh, I am my mind. So this is myself, a body mind, that's me. And that feels like me. And I feel like that's me. And I have a psychological self image, that's me too. And we live in this Santa Claus like uh, hallucination of this me being real, but the mind taking the body and mind to be a self is like looking at a rope and thinking it's a snake. So instead of the body being a rope, it's a body mind. And instead of it being looked as a snake, it's being looked at as a self, as a me. And so we can, you know, discover deeper levels from there. So it's, this is, you know, really not your normal kind of um, progressive path. Well, I think we should definitely get into into the way of light a little bit more. And it sounds, it sounds as if it's, it's uh, in the direction of some kind of spirituality of the future, something that a kind of global possibility that's not dependent on cultural uh, conditioning or, or specific uh, belief systems. This is a kind of universal possibility, if I'm understanding you correctly. Well, what I, what I, what I'm doing really is just explaining what's been experienced here that's validated by the real masters of these different traditions because we're speaking the same language. There's not a lot of those masters who talk like this, but they are there. And I found that they're all saying the same exact thing in their highest, what I would call their highest expressions of this. And so if I express that from my perspective, I don't have to go into the traditional languaging of a particular um, cult or a particular uh, lineage or um, cultural flavor. I can just, you know, use plain, simple English to be able to do it. That's all the way of light is. It's not like it's a, a composed system. It's just simply kind of like the explaining the nature of reality as it is. A little bit like uh, if you're familiar with a, an Indian teacher by the name of Nisikardatta. 
he kind of didn't really promote any kind of cultural religious thing. He just sort of was deconstructing all of the various things you do. And very much part of what I do is deconstructing uh, the first day or so, if not two days of my uh, retreats that I do. All I do is deconstruct our beliefs in these various Santa Clauses and other things that we firmly believe and hold hold on to as being true. And I point out and have us look at examples to where we can slowly be deconstructing these uh, ignorant beliefs we uh, hold on to so dearly. Mm. So, so can you say more about about the way of light? You're, you're starting by deconstructing kind of beliefs and these sanic, these illusions that we have, and from that place of deconstruction, which I think is mostly in the domain of beliefs, um, looking at our ego fixations, aware, understanding what awareness is, the ground of being. Can you say more about that process and then where you go from there in the teaching? Okay. Um, if that's well, well, basically, awesome. you know, it, it's it's working fundamentally. It's it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of dialogue. Um, talking to an audience, you can kind of speak broadly, but you can't really have the same success you can as a kind of vigorous two-way communication, where I'm able to work with the blind spots that are being presented or are obvious to me and aren't obvious to the person who has the blind spot to where I can be able to just deconstruct that blind spot and deconstruct the next blind spot in that person. So it's, it's not really kind of generically applicable. Like, you know, a dentist can't just do the same on everybody. <laughs> it's got to kind of, bring it down to individual mouths and individual teeth and individual situations. So it's kind of like that. But there are some um, basic kind of things in this way of light perspective that will eventually be a, a book of this as it downloads into <laughs> some sort of um, organized fashion in, into, into a book to be able to lay it out as, as you're asking you know, for me to explain it. But fundamentally, it's understanding initially who and what you are foremost. Am I my body? Most people start out, particularly if they're new to any of this, they have no doubt they are their body. They are their physical body. What else could I be? Oh, well, I've learned I have a soul. Well, you have a soul? I mean, the, you're a body, but you have a soul somewhere in there. And when you die, that soul leaves you because you're the body? Or you go with the soul, and then if that's the case, what are you? If you have a soul, or you are a soul, what, what, are you, what are we saying here? So that can be one of the first areas you kind of look at as to these identifications. That's what we're really cutting through. That's the main core of all of this deconstruction of ignorance is deconstructing the false identifications. I am this, I am that, and so forth and so on. These identifications of a self that you aren't. So we're really discovering what you aren't is what you are. What you think you are is what you aren't. And so this is this process of looking into these very specific things. I think I am my body, well, what's the alternative? And so then we could look at, well, what is your consciousness? You know, What is it that's aware of your thoughts? Like if you close your eyes and you're, you're observing thoughts taking place, what is it that's aware of those thoughts? Uh, an exercise I use is to, you know, have a light, a light in the room or to look outside at the sun and you close your eyes and you look at the light coming in through the eyes with your eyes closed and you see kind of this orangey color coming through the, uh, through the eyelids and you just sit and you look at that orangey color. And then I can say to you, what is it that's aware of the orangey color? Oh, so there is an awareness in here that's kind of, it's like it's behind the orangey color and it's looking forward at this orangey color. What is it that's observing this orangey color? That's one way of looking at what is this that's looking? What is this that's looking? Another example is another exercise I do 
is you close your eyes and you visualize a dog. And I say any dog, a memory of a dog, a dog you used to have, an imaginary dog, you know, a cartoon dog, any kind of dog. When you have the dog in your mind, everybody's eyes are closed, everybody raise their hand. And I look around the room and all the hands are up. I say, so now you're looking at a dog. What is it that's looking at the dog? What is that? We got the dog there, but what's looking at the dog? What is it that knew to say that you're seeing the dog and you could answer the question to raise your hand when you are seeing the dog? What is it that's seeing the dog and has the intelligence to be able to say, I'm seeing a dog and I can answer the question that I am seeing a dog? What is that that's seeing the dog? Then we have to drill down on that further to clarify that there's something in here, it seems, you know, but some people could say, oh, that's the brain that's seeing the dog. And, you know, no, no, that's, that's, that's a cop-out, you know. The, what is it? The, we, the neurons. The neurons in the front, the neuron, the prefrontal lobes, the occipital cortex. What part of the brain are you talking about that's seeing the dog? Because they have no idea in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we narrow down on this, this awareness that's seeing the dog, that's seeing the orange colors. And then you can be looking at thoughts. What is it that's noticing the thoughts? I say, Start thinking of different vegetables, favorite vegetables. Think about it for a moment, then go to the next vegetable. What is it that's aware of these thoughts of these vegetables in your mind? What is that that's aware of those vegetables? That's starting to bring the attention towards this, this awareness. Then we can relax. We're not going to look at vegetables now. And I ask the question, well, okay, so what is it that was looking at the vegetables? I want you to take your attention instead of sort of looking upwards at where the vegetables were appearing in your mind or the dog or the orange, and instead sort of turn that attention backwards. It's not a real mechanical thing, but it's just the idea of bringing your attention back upon your awareness that was observing the vegetables or the dog or the orange at the eyelids. What was it, what is it that's there? And just look, sort of looking backwards into your own consciousness, what do you see? Do you see a color? Do you see a shape? Do you see a body? Do you see a form? What do you see there? And I let them look at that for a, a little bit. And I say to them, okay, Raise your hand if, if you've done that, okay? Joe or Nancy, what, Joe, what did you see? Well, I didn't see anything at all, okay? But was there an experience of awareness being present that wasn't seeing anything at all? Yeah. There's an awareness here, but when I look to see what this awareness is, it doesn't seem to have any substance doesn't seem to have any color. I can't find anything that's producing it or generating it. And then I'll say, well, is that your consciousness that was looking at the vegetables and that was looking at the dog and so forth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what this consciousness is. It's empty. Is it empty like there's nothing there at all? complete nihilism, or is there an awareness in that emptiness? Oh yeah, there's awareness there. I'm aware that, it's, that, it's, that I'm conscious. There's an awareness of, of whether the vegetables or whatever, there, there's an awareness there. Okay, so your awareness we've decided is empty, but yet it's aware and conscious, and it has the ability to observe. Yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of like a, a beginning to enter into your true nature. And we're not going to find anything more than that. We're just going to go more deeply into the nature of this consciousness that's conscious and aware right now that's always been there. <laughs> but your mind has been too much focused on the vegetables and the dogs and the thoughts and the images and the perceptions and the, to even notice what it is that's doing the noticing. 
What is it that's seeing everything? What is it that's knowing everything? When you really look inside to see what's there. And then as we go further along this process, we we're discovering more interesting aspects uh, about this. So for instance, we won't go much further with this, but at this point, but we could, mm. but if, if you close your eyes and you listening to a sound, any sound you might have in the room or around, and you notice this awareness that we just were looking at, and you're experiencing the sound occurring in your mind or in your head, so to speak. You're experiencing sound. Can you find any distance between the sound and the awareness of it? Is there the sound that's kind of like in one part of your mind and then the awareness is apart from it? Or can you not separate the sound from the awareness of the sound? And we look into that. So we go along like this. Now we're entering directly in. I mean, this is like, by this time, their head is in the jaws of the tiger. <laughs> they're, they're in the process. And this is what we go deeper into and it reveals everything. And it will reveal that as this becomes more luminous, it'll, it'll brighten up as you put attention on it. It's like, it's like you're, you're a flashlight and whatever you put your attention on brightens up. Mm. And so when you put your attention on your attention itself or on the awareness itself, it brightens up. And as it brightens up, it begins to differentiate itself from its environment, so to speak, you start to sense that you're not your you, this consciousness is not connected to the body, that it's not in the brain per se, but it's occupying a similar space as the brain. And we can go into this further, and you can experience this maybe moving away from the brain. You can experience an opening at the top of the fontanelle, and it seems like it's opening, and you can float right out the top as this consciousness. But you're starting to redefine what you are instead of being the body, you're now this consciousness. That's a huge change in identity. But that's where your liberation and your salvation is, is realizing you're that and not the body and not the mind. And the mind is the thoughts. That's the vegetables and the dogs and the different things you're thinking. Those are things that are appearing in consciousness, but they don't change, alter, or affect consciousness. And once you start to see that there's nothing like a mirror with reflections appearing in it, all the different reflections can appear, but none of them change the mirror, you start realizing that your consciousness is, is like a mirror. It's not a mirror, but it's like a mirror in the sense that all of these appearances can appear to it, but nothing changes it. Nothing alters it. No traumas. Nothing can affect it negatively or positively. And when the, when the identification of being a body, being a mind, being a, a head, or being any of these material things starts to dissolve, and it's seen that you are just this pure, empty consciousness that's aware, and that nothing changes it, you can have a daydream. When the daydream's gone, your awareness is the same. You can have a night dream, and you wake up in the morning, and this Consciousness is the same. Different thoughts can come and go, and this is the same. Emotional states can come and go, and this is the same. You start to discover your nature has always been liberated. It has never needed an additional thing called enlightenment. It's always been free. It's just that it's been falsely identified with being a body, being a mind, and so forth. So in this way, we discover very directly that we've always, always have been liberated. You can't find any example to where we could possibly suffer. All we're experiencing, if a, if a moment of suffering arises, it's arising in the mirror like reflections, and then it's disintegrating. But you're still the same. You're this awareness in which it's appearing. Mm. So there you go. That's fantastic. So what comes to mind is, 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 is that in your book, The Natural uh, Bliss of Being, you talk about the role of energy practices 
to deepen or integrate perhaps the realization that you're pointing to now. And if I remember correctly, you say in the energy related practices, people often have a more lasting or profound integration of this realization, which leads me, I guess, back into the body or subtle body. So can you talk about how the disembodied consciousness that you're referring to integrates deeply with the energy body or physical body to create a more um, holistic experience? Well, it's not really like that, but um, it's, again, a different way of, of dealing with those exact terms. It's that there's an identification with the prana. There's an identification with the chakras that you still think you are this inner subtle body, this inner subtle energy. And if you bring the kundalini, this is, again, a somewhat technical term, but if you bring certain energies up from the bottom of the spine, and to answer your question, and I have to answer it honestly, do you yeah. bring these energies up the spine, up into and through the central channel, up into the crown chakra, and the third eye begins to open and so forth, all of those pranas and the, the most refined aspect of those pranas, kundalini, suddenly is experienced in the crown, in, in this awareness consciousness as being the nature of this empty awareness itself. So it's, it's not other than this empty awareness, but as long as it was active in the body, it, it had a sense of selfness to it. It feels, it has a feeling quality of the prana. And that becomes an identification. I am the prana. When you get into the more subtle levels of this, I'm not the physical body, but I'm the, I'm the chakra body. I'm the subtle body. But you have, to, you have to disassociate with that as well, that you're not, the, you're not the subtle body either. And then we go into, you know, you're not the ego, the I, the me. You're not any of these particular identifications. And so it's more and more subtle. But the, the, the point is that for Westerners, I think, is really what I was talking, that was the audience I was referring to, that many of them over-intellectualize. They're trying to learn it from the book, so to speak, and trying to visualize what it's like to swim and that they can somehow transition from the book reading to the experience without jumping in the water. Or that there's just the book experience is going to bring them the experience of be, jumping in the water. And if you work with the inner energies, it's less intellectual and it's more dealing with the whole process of cognition and awareness and consciousness. Plus your, 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 um, your uh, dissolving the reifications or the solidities of that con contracted, constricted prana in the body, which gives one a sense of localized feeling because of the contraction of the inner energy makes you feel like you're right here. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes released and disassociated when the knot of the sense of being a self in the heart, that sense of me releases suddenly there's this expansion and suddenly there's no sense of localization any longer. It's just, there's no self. It's just like oneness with the universe, so to speak, but it, more of a oneness with transparent clarity, which is all pervading, which we call in this system, the mind of clear light, which is, it's not comprehensible in terms of conceptual designations. So that's a, that's a means for people who seem to be too caught up in their head. They can be working more with the energy, but that then becomes a problem too, because then they become addicted to the, the sensations of bliss and all these various kind of almost orgasmic experiences to where they think that's it, to have an experience. But this isn't an experience because experiences just appear in this empty awareness and go. So it doesn't have an experience itself. It's the absence of any of its own experience so that it can accommodate all experience. So most people are getting in some sort of way attached to some sort of blissful or some kind of experience when they're doing the body work. But again, I may be working with somebody and have them do that because they need that kind of grounding to get them out of their head. But there's other ways to address it as well, not necessarily through having to go and do that type of energy work. There's other types of energy work that can ground somebody. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So how, how do you think of, um, I guess it's difficult to put a lot of these ideas into language. You do a fantastic job. Um, 
the the realization or awakening that might occur as a result of the teaching that you're referring to do you see that as the beginning of a process of further integration does that does that kickstart something or do you see that as the end and the beginning of something is it not even a useful way of thinking about it uh to put it in these chronological kind of distinctions i'm wondering I guess the reason I'm asking that is because I'm curious what you have observed uh, in others or in yourself in terms of what occurs or changes from prior to and after a moment of realization and sort of what the process is following that moment. Uh, is that a, a, an infinite process of deepening and change? How do you conceptualize I would say it's like the second step in Garab Dorje's Dzogchen teaching of getting beyond doubt. So the first is that kind of that insight of that experience of that empty presence. That's what some teachers refer to it as empty presence, presence of awareness that is not material. This consciousness that I was pointing to behind your eyes, the consciousness that was looking at the vegetables or whatever the thoughts and everything that's experiencing, that consciousness itself is not in a body and it's in that space and time. It's not in the universe at all. It's like an empty, it's like the opposite of what the universe is. The universe is stuff. It's energy, things, objects, and stuff, so to speak. And this is like the opposite end of the pole. This is the absolute emptiness, a complete voidness of things other than awareness, consciousness. It's an emptiness consciousness. And that emptiness consciousness is eternally, you could say, stable. It doesn't change, it doesn't move. It's like the mirror. And all the reflections are what's changing. The reflection is your body, the reflection is your mind, the reflection is the environment, the reflection is your planet, the world, all of these various things, and the universe, galaxies, and all of these things are appearing in this empty space of consciousness, while this empty space of consciousness itself isn't changing in any way. It's not in the universe. The universe arises in it and uh, is experienced by it because it's the only thing that's aware. See, it's, it's not that the, the brain is aware, the mind is aware, the body is aware, or anything else in the universe is aware. You are the only aware thing. That's this consciousness. That's what you are. And you're not in the universe. The you that's in the universe is the, the misidentification. The body is in the universe. The subtle body is in the universe. Uh, the ego is in the universe because it's in the mind and it's in the associated with the brain and these various other uh, um, energetic activities. But you're not energetic. You're not material. You have no substance. You're the opposite of all substance. You're the absence, the absolute, not a little bit absent, but the absolute absence of all substance. And so that's the experience that you start to, that starts to um, become revealed to yourself, this purity of this consciousness that never changes. It's, it can't become unstable because there's nothing about it. Like how does space become unstable? You know, open space, how does it become, you know, unstable? Yeah, I went outside and I noticed the space was a little bit unstable. No, it's, it's <laughs> there's nothing to it to become unstable. So there's nothing to you to become unstable. The mind becomes unstable, but that's not you. That's an appearance in what you are, this awareness that doesn't change. So what occurs is different states of mind occur in this with varying degrees of energy and intensity, which give the, uh, um, the illusion that you've lost it that you've lost this open spaciousness, but that whole illusion of that self having lost it is just an appearance in what you are as this empty space of awareness. Mm -hmm. And so it can be as though it's, there's a confusion there, but the confusion isn't in, in what you are. The confusion is in the mind, not being able to, to grasp some kind of identity to itself. And so you're just experiencing a mind grasping with perhaps a sense of egoic identity saying, I'm, I'm suffering, I'm confused, I lost it, I lost it. What are those? Those are just thoughts. Those are just thoughts passing through this empty space of consciousness like the vegetables and the dog and everything else. So this state of confusion is just like another uh, vegetable that you've just visualized in your mind and it's, it's passing through, it's this, through this empty space of consciousness. You getting the feel of this? Yeah, absolutely. And um, perhaps it's my 
New Yorker Jew cynicism, uh, uh, or not even cynicism, but I'm really interested in the potential pitfalls that come with that because it's obviously, it's, um, I recently spoke with a Jungian analyst, uh, James Hollis. Yes. And something that was interesting, he talked about how when he was in his 30s, he, he thought this kind of consciousness Having, having enough consciousness being, being as deep into this kind of absolute consciousness as possible would be the answer to a lot of problems. And then he discovered from his point of view that that consciousness is often informed by complexes or shadows. Perhaps that's what you were referring to with some of the spiritual teachers who were maybe abusing their, their students or whatnot. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering how, how does one because this is the place beyond a one, so there's nobody to self-reference. But what are the ways to to measure or track uh, progress or intensity or depth of the state um, such that one doesn't become inflated somehow by the possible uh, elation of of the experience? Because what you what you were just describing sounded so remarkable i mean beyond the stratosphere and then we're back in this human body so so i am not asking such a coherent question but maybe you can feel no, your you way. are you asking you're asking a very coherent coherent well thought out question so now let's take a look at from from a different perspective what what's taking place there in your mind relative to our topic the awareness in your mind your your awareness which is not in space and time, what's passing through it in your description to me is thoughts. That's all. And all thoughts are empty. They're like clouds that you can't grasp. They're like a thought is like a cloud passing through in the sky. You can see it. You can see their differentiation from each other but you can't grasp them, they have no core because they're not real in the sense of having some kind of legitimate objective uh, substance. So everything you were expressing, all of these concepts, conceptual constructions, conceptual designations uh, involving you know, psychological concepts of shadows and all of these things, those are all just thoughts, all of them equally. They're equally all just like cumulus clouds passing through the sky. And so they're empty by nature. So all of those thoughts you just thought were just empty clouds passing through the space of your awareness that never changes. So where's the problem? Yeah, I, I, I do get, I get that. It's, it's not that there's a- uh, Wait, 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 wait. You're doing it again. You're starting the thinking again. Here's yeah, the but problem. That's, that's it. No problem. There's, well, that's good. Now then stop. <laughs> the pro <laughs> the, it's the thinking that produces the illusion that there's not only a problem, but somehow something has been lost. Because like a, the ego thought arises, and that says, I don't feel this sense of depth of, of blah, blah, blah. But that's not you. You're the awareness in which that thought is appearing and you're not identified. You can't be identified with a thought because you're the empty space in which thoughts are appearing. So you're never identified with a thought. The mind gets identified with other thoughts. The mind, the, a thought is kind of a thought thought. And that's what's, what's occurring. But the whole, the whole, this is the simplicity of this. It's, it's not complicated, it's very simple. There's awareness and there's thoughts. The awareness is what's aware of those thoughts, and, the, and those thoughts don't change or alter the awareness that's aware of the thought. There's no change in this space of awareness, no matter what thought is appearing or storyline or narrative or psychological interpretation, it's all just thoughts appearing and then they cease. And then maybe some more different thoughts occur. But the space in which those thoughts are occurring is never affected by any of the thoughts that are occurring. And there's no self in that space that feels bad. There's a thought, oh, I, oh, I feel bad. Those are you know, three thoughts, four thoughts. 
And that's what's passing through this space of what you are. But none of those affect that space that's aware of those. So a, a real easy solution is if you're kind of like, this is kind of a shortcut thing, which I don't really like, but it works. And that's like, if you're in some kind of mind state, the way to just to blow out of it immediately is to say, what is it that's aware of this mind state, this state of mind? Well, I feel anxious right now. I feel stressed. I feel out of it. I feel, you know, like I'm off center. Observe that condition. Observe it fully, allow it to be there. And then say, what is it that's aware of this exact state just as it is? What is it that's aware of this experience? And that pulls the identification with the experience out. And suddenly it's seen that that which seemed to be subjectively a subject, you in that experience is suddenly in the object position. And, you, and there's this kind of like this, oh, that wasn't me. Not in those words, <laughs> just like, ah. That there was this thought that occurred, kind of like a, a dream entity, like when you're falling asleep at night and you're not really asleep, the, the dream can kind of start. And it starts with a sense of your own consciousness appearing in the dream landscape. That's what happens during the daytime when you lose it. What you, this idea of you're talking about you're losing it is that a sense of a self identity arises from the subconscious, so to speak, and it's arising into consciousness. And it's like a self, the self you were in a dream at night, because at night you feel like you are really in the dream. You are really having tigers chasing you and you have a real body. But the point I'm trying to make is you feel like you are you as a conscious entity in the dream. That sense of the subconscious producing a you in the dream is what's happening in the daytime. You wake up in the morning and the subconscious projects a new me or you, which then has to get up, take a shower and get to work. And it's got its whole agenda, just like you've got an agenda in your dream. Both are projections of the subconscious. And they're both arising in this empty, pure space in which they aren't. So whatever is occurring in your mind, if it seems like it's, again, I don't like these shortcuts, but if there's something that's arising in your mind and there's the sense of discomfort, ex experience it. Don't be in the middle of fighting and say, oh, I hate this. I wish this would go away. Blah, blah, blah. Just accept it, experience it and say, what, and, but stay with this, but what is it that's aware of this? And then, turn up the aware side of it instead of the experience side. So if the experience side is a stressful feeling, an energetic feeling, what is aware of this energetic feeling? So you, bring, you put the flashlight, instead of putting the flashlight of attention on the energetic discomfortable feeling or thought, you put the, the flashlight of attention on the awareness that's aware of that feeling. And with that, that feeling dissolves. Mm. so all you're doing is shifting see the whole i wrote a text today something about the power of attention and whatever you put your attention on is what grows so if you put your attention on your thoughts they grow if you put your attention onto a, a little thought it can grow into a narrative or it can grow into a novel if you put your attention on the awareness that's aware of those thoughts it brightens up and whatever was being attended to dissolves because it can't exist without your attention. So any thought, trauma, or problem you have in your mind, you're giving attention to if it's bothering you. If you take your attention off of it, even subconscious attention in a trauma, and you take your attention off of it, and you put it on that to, from which the attention is arising from, your awareness, that energetic formation, that trauma, that memory, whatever it is, dissolves. Because it needs your, your attention. <laughs> So what you're literally doing in daily life, you are a Buddha. This awareness is a Buddha, and it's generating its world through its thoughts. So whatever thoughts you're putting your attention on, that's the world you're getting. The world of a, of a, of a um, what was the, I don't, I don't know what the, what the term is, but it's a, a kvetching, kvetching kind of a person that's always going from one, situation you know to to another 
oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. It's always this, you know, next thing going to the next thing. That's what you're projecting. You're projecting yourself as that, but you're not aware of that. So when you bring your awareness back to the awareness, which is projecting those thoughts and those feelings and that sense of personality, it dissolves because it requires your energy, your electricity to vivify it, to, to make it come alive. So you are a Buddha and you're creating your world right now, but you're pretending, you're projecting a self like a self in a dream that doesn't know it's in the dream, but sometimes you can project a self in the dream that knows it's a dream and it wakes up. Likewise, you're projecting a self right now that doesn't know that it's not real and that it's a projection of, a, of your own Buddha mind in the game field, mm -hmm. playing the game. So all the Buddhas are playing the game of being in the game field, but they have to project a game player. And that game player is like the self you project in a dream at night the tigers can chase, but you feel like you're real, real. Like right now, you may feel you are this real personality, body, I am, identification, and so forth, but that's a projection. So the ultimate result of this particular path is just realizing what you're doing. And if it doesn't feel good, stop doing it. Stop projecting it. Stop projecting the feeling. Stop projecting that. How do you do that? By bringing your attention back to the place where the energetic energy of your attention is coming from that's energizing the projections. And this includes your perceptions. This includes the world out there, which is also your projection. So, mm -hmm. so much good stuff in there. And I, I guess two things come to mind. One is the correlate of that naturally is that not everything is inherently meaningless and that we create meaning and project meaning. And I wouldn't say, I would, let me interrupt you there. Um, I wouldn't say that everything is meaningless because everything is projected with the meaning that it has. So for instance, let's say you're in a dream. When you're in a, in a dream at night and you feel fear, you see tigers in the distance you may sense there's a neutral you consciousness in the dream. And because of the tigers, fear arises in you, the neutral consciousness. But that's not how it works. The subconscious is projecting you as a, an afraid me or a happy me or whatever. So the sense of there being something neutral is simply what that projection is. If it's a neutral projection, it's being projected neutrally. If it's being projected as a warm and fuzzy kind of experience, that's how it's being projected. And the self is being projected with the feelings it has in that environment also. It's all part of the projection. But in this particular teaching, which seems to be across the boards, going all the way from Neoplatonic thought of Plotinus and these others, the fundamental nature of your inner core of this awareness, this Buddha mind, is naturally good. And it's natural goodness in all of these sort of Buddhist related things. Say this energy of projection is called bodhicitta. So the energy isn't neutral at all. It's at the, if we say in quantum physics, at the level of the Planck scale, at the, at the smallest possible level, there's these archetypical energies of bodhicitta, of unconditional love and compassion, which are the very nature of the projection. Mm. That's so helpful and, and that's beautiful because I think I think a lot of a lot of teachings that are around non-duality or around or even human potential, like the S training or landmark. I don't know if you're familiar with those things. I am, I am, I am. This whole notion that's repeated, life is empty and meaningless. That life is empty and meaningless, nothing means anything. And so what you're doing is you're, at, you're, you're bringing kind of unconditional love as a sort of fundament. Uh, All of these traditions have unconditional love as their ultimate essence, inner essence. And it's all a manifestation and display of this unconditional love in which there's no one in there who gets harmed. There's no one in there who is damaged or traumatized. It's all part of the projection. And if you're not seeing it from that perspective, then all of that stuff is horrible, it's true, and so forth. But, and you'll never be free of that. So that means suffering is yours forever. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
Well, I don't know. I think we really covered covered a lot in this conversation so far. I know we can go into a lot of different directions and perhaps maybe that's a future conversation into the quantum world and sure. many other things. But but um, is there anything just for now that, that you feel we should touch on or that comes up for you that we haven't touched on? I would just say, you know, it's like you really got a full dose here, in my opinion. And it's like, um, just keep it real. You know, just keep it real. That's my my basic tenant, and um, keep it real in the sense of not speculating, going into the thought processes, and all of these teachings. And I don't care which one. We could take any of these traditions that I've talked about, and they all have as kind of like a a breakthrough. You know, you fly in a jet airplane, and it takes off, and the weather's raining, and it's crappy, and so forth, and they get to a certain altitude. They break through the cloud layer, and it's just blue, beautiful sky. You have to break through that cloud level in all of these traditions. They all say you have to break through that cloud level and come into the open sky, and that cloud level is thought and thinking. And that's why it's so difficult for Western, well, it's almost the whole world now. It's not really even Western and Eastern anymore. It's all this sort of intellectualized um, prioritization of our experiences being, you know, living in our minds and our goals and all of this sort of stuff. You've got to be in that space that is beyond thought where no thoughts are occurring, where you've really, you know, come to this um, place of what they would call nervi kalpa samadhi or um, niroda, where the conceptualizing mind has become quiet and still, and that you're in this dimension now of pure perception without a thinking mind um, obscuring it with all of these uh, kind of cloud-like uh, visions of these different thoughts that are you know appearing here and there and are, seem to be distracting to your attention. So the only way you can really become free of this this plateau of thought, which is the the whole the whole re, the whole answer to your question about how do you find this stability and so forth and so on, is by not descending back into the clouds of thought. When you're engaged in thought, conceptualizing, you know, and it, it can be at first it's like, what do you mean without thought? I'm always in thought and so forth. Well, once you look into this a little more, you'll get some gaps between the thoughts, and you'll be experiencing more of the space between the thoughts. And that when you're in all of these traditions, until you break through the cloud of thoughts, which produce the ego, the false sense of self, the self that's suffering, the self that needs enlightenment, the seeker, all of these things are just thoughts. There isn't any of that stuff other than your thoughts, your conceptual constructions of that. Once your mind is free of that thought processing and, and uh, speculation, then you're in this, this other domain of consciousness, which has its own version of thought called wisdom and uh, prajna and jhana. And it's, it's not thought. It's, it's a different kind of FM band versus the AM radio band. You know, like you're in the FM band and it's much, you know, richer and it's a whole different thing. That's the thing I'd leave you with is that you have to break through this attachment to thought. And the way you do that is by bringing your awareness from the thoughts back to the space of the awareness, which from which the attention is coming out onto the thought. And when a thought is occurring, say, what's aware of that thought? What's aware of this thought I'm into? What's aware of this daydream I was just into? And that way you kind of pop the attention free and it comes back instead of manifesting as that thought, because the thought isn't there taking your attention. You're projecting the thought and you're projecting the attention into it. You're reversing that and the attention you're feeding to it, you're bringing that attention back towards the awareness from which it's coming out of. And in that moment, the thought disappears. So by asking yourself who or what is aware, what is aware of this thought right now? What is aware of this emotional state right now? What is aware of this perception right now? What is it that's aware of this experience right now? Reduce everything to just experience. Everything. Everything is an experience. But what's aware of that experience? What's aware of this experience? What's aware of this? So you don't have to break it up into thoughts and emotions, all that. It's just an experience. All these things are names for different types of experiences, but it's fundamentally just an experience. But what's the awareness within that experience? You, you pop out of that 
kind of crystallization and reification of the energetic aspects of that consciousness. Yeah, amazing. And um, for those of us with cell phones and social media, there's certainly a, there's a battlefield for our thoughts and our attention that's accelerating. But at the same time, we get to share teachings like yours. So hopefully, hopefully that the this the spreading of the teachings uh, keeps up and accelerates alongside the the challenge uh, that's creating a lot of thought through social media technology, etc. So. Well, I'm very grateful for, for everything you shared with me, Jackson. Your, your book is called The Natural Bliss of Being. Uh, do you want to share anything about where people can find you online or anything like that? Well, um, www.wayoflight.net takes you to my website, which is fairly crude, but good enough for the purpose. And uh, in that, you can see some of my videos. And I have the links, I believe, to my Facebook groups and to my book. I would recommend uh, to get a general, really good general idea of what we're talking about and give you the setup to be able to understand it, to be able to put this to use. I highly recommend you purchase my book. And I always say, if people purchase my book and they're not absolutely pleased with it, let me know and I'll send you a refund. But you can buy it at Amazon and... Uh, but it's really valuable for you in pulling this all together into a much more detailed um, discussion like we, we've had in this video. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. <laughs>